Thank you everybody again for joining. Um, we're so excited to present this event um, with the API ERG and LATAM base. We're really excited to bring you the hosts of Mexico Pino podcast, um, Nico and Jackie, who will be arriving shortly. Um, but before we get started, just want to share a little bit about like why we're doing this anyway. Um, as you know, you know, Hispanic Heritage Month started September 15th. Filipino American Heritage Month started October 1st. And the intersection of those months to me personally has always felt really relevant. Growing up, my house, my dad spoke Spanish and Tagalog and my mom did the same. I always felt more in, like in touch with like whenever there were the Asian club at my high school or there was like a Latino club at my high school because like you know early 2000s 90s there isn't like PC but the, <laughs> those are the names of the clubs in my schools and I always felt more at home interestingly enough in the Latino community they felt like they embraced me a lot more and I saw a lot more in common from the food the language, the music, the, you know, family expectations, and just all of it all around. I personally never experienced, for better or worse, the like classic stereotype of Asian parents who are like on you about your grades and all that. Expectations for me were below the ground. So I was easy to surpass that. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so I don't know. I just always felt really at home in that community. And then the intersection and learning about how Spain colonized the Philippines for so long. And that was like the, the predominant definer of our culture for a long time. Like that was really interesting. And so in college, one of my best friends and I, she's Dominican, I'm Filipino, of course. And we went around Boston. We convinced the one of the departments to give us money so we could eat at Dominican, Colombian, Mexican, Puerto Rican restaurants, and then a Filipino restaurant. Um, and then we photographed all the dishes. And then we wanted to showcase how similar the cultures were um, through their food and how it linked, how it linked us despite the oceans that were separating us. Um, so just to like kill a little bit of time, I'll share. I just want to share the like, this is from a while ago. This is almost 10 years ago. So, you know, I don't <laughs> like a minute ago, but like these are dishes that when we photographed them and they we laid them out and displayed them, people were like, are these Filipino? Are these Dominican? Are they Colombian? Like, what, what is this? Like, why is adobo used so much in everything? Um, and just, it was, a really cool experience to be able to do. So um, with that being said, we'd love to now talk through um, and give a little bit of background on, on, on some of the, on our lovely hosts here today. Um, so I'll start with Nico um, as we wait for Jackie. Um, Nico is a Filipino American DJ. He's a media personality, a radio producer whose goal is to build community through the power of music. He's the DJ radio producer for nationally syndicated show, The Bootleg Kev Show, on 10 plus radio stations in the US, hosts for your own Nico Blitz podcast, and co hosts for the Mexico Pino podcast with Jackie Ramirez. You're also a partnered Twitch streamer who specializes in DJing and fundraising. And over the pandemic, he did raise um, over $30,000 in donations for the Philippines Typhoon Relief and Stop AAPI Hate. Um, so that's pretty incredible all on its own. Um, but yes, hello, hello, Nico, friend of Crunchbase, friend of Anthony. So we very excited to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having me. It, it's funny that uh, you mentioned that because, uh, I mean, I haven't been on Twitch for a while, but during the pandemic, you know, I think a lot of us were just trying to find purpose out of boredom, 
but like you know when all of that stuff happened um between like the philippines with a massive typhoon a couple of typhoons hitting them like during that year and you know i mean we all obviously saw plenty of videos of like elderly asian people getting just attacked or you know getting their money stolen um although the pandemic was something that affected us um in a physical sense um it were it was those things that affected me so much more on an emotional sense so whenever i do think about the trauma that happened during the pandemic those are the two things that stick out to me the most so when we were on twitch as jackie ramirez enters the building hi everyone hi jackie um but you know as we were on twitch a lot of us from across the world were just trying to find purpose in this time right now and so you know raising money for the philippines not only helped those in need at that time but it also helped us build community like within ourselves so that's helped me like travel across the world over the past year or two and it's built a lot of friendships and communities that I would have otherwise not acquired if it wasn't for that so yeah that's that's amazing and and um yeah I think we can all relate to being so bored we're just looking for something ways to create to keep ourselves alive um awesome well welcome Jackie um I want to give you your own proper introduction here so Jackie Ramirez is a Mexican-American media personality and host, everybody, starting her career as a community street team member for the LA Football Club. She's continued on to work as an in-stadium host for various organizations like the LA Dodgers, the LA Galaxy, and she now works as a co-host for not just the Mexifino podcast with Nico, but also LA's number one afternoon show, The Cruise Show. So welcome, Jackie and Nico. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys for having us. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Interviewed Usher. That's. <laughs> yes. Interviewed Usher. <laughs> I just uh, wrapped up uh, an interview with Neo right now. So I literally stormed out of there and came over here. So yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's always like a, so just mind-blowing to me when I'm like oh my gosh I'm literally interviewing you right now but it's it's um something that I've been blessed with and yeah that I'm able to do this as as a Latina as well so that's awesome well we feel extra blessed to be interviewing both of you guys today um and with that I'll kick it over um to Maria to set up the the next set of questions yeah awesome so for this event we really wanted to explore something that sometimes is commonly low known, but often not really. And so that is the intersection between Mexican and Filipino culture. So um, again, super thankful to have you both with us today to have a conversation about your own experience hosting the Mexipino podcast, um, but also learning a little bit more about how you find your inspiration in the communities that you engage with and um, a little bit more about you both and how you've grown up over the last few years. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Sounds great. Um, cool. You want to take that off? Yeah. I'm like, you uh, want to start first? Because so he's well, a talker, yeah. so he, he talks a lot more and then I kind of... <laughs> so what's the first question we're tackling? <laughs> well, so to get started, we would love for you to take us all the way back and share a little bit more about like what your home looked like when you were growing up, where'd you grew up, like what your family looked like. Okay, like cool. So I'm uh, originally from San Francisco, California. I'm over here in LA right now. <laughs> um, and around the area I grew up, there was a lot of Filipinos, mm -hmm. especially in the Daly City area. So like literally there'd be like Filipino restaurants on the corner. There, There's literally like a Filipino mall. It's like Filipino everything. Mm -hmm. So growing up, I can honestly say there was so much Filipino going on that, um, you know, by the time I moved to L.A., um, rather, when I was over there, I didn't want to be Filipino. I was like, I'm surrounded by this too much, and I rejected my culture. I didn't really take the time to learn Tagalog, which is my family's foreign tongue. I didn't really get to take the time to learn more about my family's history, and I wasn't really privy to 
um, Filipino celebrities and people who are just pushing for the culture uh, outside of like Manny Pacquiao, right? <laughs> That's like a name you just cannot dismiss at all. Um, fast forward. Canelo. When, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so when I moved to LA, I, I got here and I'm just like, damn, where's all the Filipinos? Like, there's all, there's nothing but Mexicans here. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I had to figure out a way to basically build the community of Filipinos that were already here. A, I had to seek out the, um, the playmakers in the culture that were over here. And then B, I had to create events that would put people together similar to like this. Um, and then C, we just keep on building on those relationships and, you know, I'm proud to say that now I'm unapologetically Filipino and like everything I do is just move with the idea that the Philippines is going to be like looking at everything that I do <laughs> and, you know, just move again, moving with purpose and hoping that um, people of Filipino descent um, can just take from what I'm currently doing. Yeah. No, I think for me uh, growing up, uh, I was born and raised in LA and, and I, what I now do, I get to do in where I, where I've lived my whole life. And I think that's a, such a huge blessing. Um, growing up, you know, both my parents, uh, I have a brother and we were very much in tune with sports. Um, and it's really funny. Cause like, I never thought I'd be doing what I was doing up until I was, I would say maybe like 17, 18. Um, and I I always wanted to be like a sports reporter for because I grew up with sports. And then I quickly figured out once I got into college, yes, yeah, statistics is not my thing. I'm not going to watch every game of every like baseball game, every football game. I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I always loved entertainment. I always loved talking to people. I always loved being on camera I and then when I figured out what entertainment hosting and entertainment reporting was, that's when I that's when I realized, OK, that's what I want to do. And there wasn't a whole bunch of people, you know, there definitely was like, you know, if you turn on Telemundo, there's going to be uh, Mexican reporters, there's going to be Latino reporters. But for me, there wasn't anyone specifically that I looked up to or that I whose pathway I, I could follow. So I knew that if I was going to pursue something that no one in my family has ever pursued, which is entertainment, they really, sometimes my family still doesn't understand. Like, so when you're off air and you're not talking on radio, are you guys just like on your phones? I'm like, no, we're working, we're creating content, we're doing everything that we can to make the ship run. And, and I think with that, like, it's just, it, they don't have a full idea of what I do, but I knew that. If I was going to do this, I knew I had to take it on, like, head on. I knew needed to do and figure out what I needed to figure out, in, like, very quickly. And so that way, you know, other people like me that want to pursue entertainment can be like, okay, well, at least I have an idea. Or, you know, I, a lot of people have reached out to me and said, like, hey, where do I start? I'm like, I I'm not a gatekeeper. I know a lot of people gatekeep, like, the places they eat, the whatever, but, like, for me, it's like, well, if I can provide this and just tell you like, hey, this is where I started. This is where I ended up and I'm still going. I'm still figuring it out. Then I can share that with others. And I think with Mexipino podcast, that was definitely one of our goals was, you know, we're both in the entertainment industry. We're both the first people in our families to pursue something completely different than any of our families. And if there's people out there that don't even know what they want to do and even want to just see what it is that we kind of do, then Mexipino podcast allows that to be like, oh, hey, this is the inside of it. And this is what our journey was like. Yeah. Additionally, too, I do also want to say that, um, you know, although Jackie and I are both pursuing um, careers in entertainment, mm -hmm. we also do not dismiss anybody who wants to pursue a career that is either quote unquote traditional mm -hmm. or untraditional, right? Yeah. So like, you know, for Filipinos, especially, um, you know, we talk about like our parents want us to be nurses and doctors. And I mm -hmm. think for like Mexican households, it's like- It's definitely like 
uh, a lot of people turn out to be in uh, in law enforcement or a teacher. And that's definitely something that, you know, I when we even started the podcast, Nico was like, oh, yeah, like, you know, it's a Filipino stereotype to be a, a nurse or be a doctor. I was like, you know, what? what's the, the, the Latino stereotype? And that's when I realized, like, oh, it's a teacher. It's a law enforcement. That's what it is. Yeah. And so, you know, we we like to enforce the idea that, like, although we are in entertainment, the the core idea is that we are pursuing what we want to do and what we love to do so we love music we love entertain entertaining people mm -hmm. so if you love to be a teacher please do that mm -hmm. if you love to be a doctor or a lawyer please do that and that's just the idea of the podcast and you know like Whenever we do stuff like our Mexipino Food Fest, we get more than just Mexicans and Filipinos coming mm -hmm. to our events, right? We get people of all different like creeds, ethnicities, races, and everything because I think a lot, everybody has latched on to that idea that like, hey, like we believe what Jackie and Nico is doing is cool. So I am going to be around this community of people who continue to just do what they love to do. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that also too, like Nico said, like Mexipino podcast and Mexipino food fest is so much more than just Mexicans and Filipinos. We literally on social media trauma bond, if you want to say it, like <laughs> with through different cultures, like all of us share experiences in our own way in very, very similar ways. Yeah. I mean, I think going back to what um you guys were talking about earlier, like there is obviously a connection from Spain. Mm. A, um, taking over the Philippines momentarily and B, trying to take over Mexico mm -hmm. for a while too. But I think at the end of the day, what does that show you? Like, yes, they con they tried to conquer both of our countries and take over. So we have a lot of like overlaps, right? We have a lot of language that is similar. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of food that is similar. We have a lot of trauma that mm -hmm. is similar. But if you look on the inside, we have that same fight. Yeah, we have that same willingness to um, be independent. And I think that's something that is often overlooked when it comes to the relationships between Mexicans and Filipinos. And I'm smiling right now mm -hmm. because that's the first time I said that. And I'm just like, damn, that's kind of fire now that I'm saying that. <laughs> <laughs> he just had a relic in your law. <laughs> as I was talking, my brain was like, yo, this is kind of good. <laughs> that was super good. <laughs> um, no, thank you so much for, for sharing. It's really great to see how you've been able to you know go out of the norm and and be able to follow your passion um do you have any advice for for those who are um in minority groups to pursue their dreams and um you know go for what they want to do despite maybe those norms that they have to you know fall follow yeah, I mean, I think my advice would just it's like it's the same cliche as like just be who you are, you know, keep on going. And what at the end of the day, it's your life. And a lot of us are a lot of us. And I know for me in particular, it took me very well, I think up until this year or late last year where I was just kind of like, I don't have to I don't have to ask for permission. I don't have to, you know keep on going back to my parents and being like, Hey, are you okay with this? Like, I, like, I still have that as I think, especially as a Latina and being the youngest in my family and especially doing something that they don't even know how to grasp. It's, it's scary. It's, it's, it's very scary to pursue something that you're not a hundred percent of like, how am I going to do this? Where do I even start? But it is your life. You have to live it unapologetically. And if, if that's, if that's holding you back, it's just something you got to break through. It's a barrier that you got to break through. And I mean, respectfully, I mean, our, our parents came here for a better life, you know, and why not live that better life? Yeah. So. Um, I think that when it comes, well, if we're talking about like a creative space, for example, or mm -hmm. just the constant pursuit of something that you love to do that doesn't necessarily 
have like you know like a job title and like am I gonna like if I do this interview can I get the job right so like um in the creative space I think what people do way too early is count themselves out Mm -hmm. I think that when I think we are all programmed to think like okay I'm gonna go through a middle school I'm gonna go through high school after high school I'm gonna go to college and after college after like four years maybe even after like 10 years, everything is guaranteed for me by the time I'm like 30 years old. (laughs) Now, the thing about it is that when you're a creative, um, nothing is guaranteed. But if you see that all of these, um, all of these trades, again, doctor, lawyer, whatever you want to call it, they take about 10 years to actually get to where you want to get to. Mm -hmm. So what I see is that a lot of people count themselves out at year one. They count themselves out at year two, year three, and don't keep going up until year 10. The reason why I'm so privy about year 10 is because I've been in LA since 2014 when I um, ended up starting college over here. And then I full on started my actual career after that in 2016. Right now it's 2023, so it's only been seven years, but it wasn't until year, I want to say year five or year six, where I actually started to feel like, oh, all the acorns that I was planting on year one, two, three, four, and five, they're actually starting to grow now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd actually like to proudly say that on year seven, which is right now, I see these, um, these acorns growing even more. So I'm even more excited to see what year eight, nine, and 10 look like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are things that nobody can really tell you. As we mentioned earlier, there's no blueprint. There's no after year two, you're going to, you're guaranteed this after year three, you just got to go through a whole bunch of this. And then you get that, like, none of that is guaranteed. Um, And that being said, I just don't want anybody to give up, Yeah, you know, and if you feel like whatever you're currently doing right now is not working. I also highly encourage everyone to look at the scope of how things are growing. Is it because of social media? Is it because of the, you know, the marketing structure that is currently set on today's norms? Mm -hmm. Is it the actual product that you are selling? Is it the information that you are giving? Mm -hmm. Are you taking an opportunity to like learn some information and share it with other people in a very constructed way and easy for them to digest? These are all these things that you have to ask yourself if you feel like things aren't working. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you that if you keep on taking a stab at it, it's going to work eventually. Yeah. And I think too, like, uh, I think this goes across all cultures. It's very embedded in us about stability, about Mm -hmm. financial stability, about, you know, you got to be this that and you have to have all these your ducks in a row in order for you to be successful because this is what our parents embedded in us and I've had this talk with Nico recently where you know my fear has always been that stability has always been financial stability and I don't enjoy my life if I always think that way if I constantly have that in the back of my head and it wasn't until I brought that up I want to say maybe a month ago uh, that I started, you know, being like, okay, like, you know what, let's just do this. Let's just go do this. And I've been living a lot happier because not only am I doing what I love to do, I pursued what I want to pursue, but I'm, I'm just happier. And mm-hmm. that, and that's, I think, you know, when I tell my parents, you know, this is what I'm doing, this, they know that I'm happy and that I'm okay. And that's all they really want. You know, that's all anyone wants in their life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Think that all of that I feel like resonates so much. I mean, for me personally, you can see in the chat for others. Um, so that's that's amazing, especially the the sentiment of never giving up, really. And see, you know, like you'll see the success at some point. So um I love that. Now I'd love to we'd love to talk a little bit more now about the Mexipino podcast particularly. So I'd love if you could walk us through kind of the journey of the pod from the moment you had the idea to your moment of feeling success for the first time um yeah Uh, well I can start and then I'll pass it to you yeah that's fun yeah (laughs) like uh I've been podcasting since like 2016 so I was interviewing like every single artist you could think of so I already had all the equipment the pandemic hit 
And then this was around the time Jackie and I started dating. Jackie told me like, hey, I've always wanted to do a podcast. Yeah. So Nico, uh, when during the pandemic, basically, obviously, every everything shut down. So uh, Nico was on Twitch a lot and he was DJing on Twitch. He did like a year, 365 days consecutively of DJing on Twitch. And yeah, it was a lot of (laughs) time. Like we got to know people from across the world. We got to like share our opinions. People found out like, you know, who we are as people through Twitch. And I've always wanted to do a podcast. I never wanted to do it alone because I was like, okay, I don't know how much of my opinions people are going to like, and it's better to bounce ideas off of somebody else. Um, So with Twitch, it was kind of like, hey, you know what, why don't we try a podcast together? And, you know, people like how much we bicker, how much we agree, how much we disagree. So why don't we just put that in podcast form? And he, like he said, he's been doing podcasting since 2016. So we just, we were just like okay so we were trying to think of a name and it literally was going through all these types of different names where I was just like we're overthinking it too much I think we should just go with Mexipino we're literally Mexican Filipino I think that's what it is and and it's worked since then and I I think the uh I think the point of like no return was like a clip that happened and Jackie was talking about um uh, how Mexican how Mexican moms usually react to their daughters oh well, yeah I was like I the clip that kind of like made us go viral at first was how I I said and I got a lot of really good heat for it and a really lot of bad heat for it but uh how Mexican moms baby their sons and you know so how, true <laughs> no 100%, it's always it's always my mijito, you know, do you guys, do you want me to cook you some huevitos, you know, this and that. And it's because I grew up with that. My mom swears that she, she doesn't do that with my brother, but she does. And still to this day, he has a whole family and she still does it. And that was the clip where we're like, oh, okay. Like we're talking about something that a lot of people relate to. A lot of people may disagree with it, but they're also probably the sons that get babied. So yeah. it's like, it's it's that was like okay all right we got it you know we got what we want out of this and this is where we should go and this is the pathway because uh, relatability is what a lot of people you know gravitate towards exactly we figured out that it's really the relatability aspect that (laughs) hooks people to the podcast right so and a lot of the times we're just talking about personal experiences and these <laughs> personal experiences you know they resonate with people like for example um when me and Jackie had went to Canada um we were trying to get a um a rental car and then I saw that the lady working at the front desk was Filipino <laughs> and so I look I turned to Jackie I was like let me see if I can work some magic really quick <laughs> so I'm talking to her and then next thing you know I speak to her in Tagalog she's like are you Filipino she said I said yeah of course, Shempre, Diva, you know, just like giving her, giving her the sauce. Right. And then um, next thing, you know, she was like, Hey, so I'm going to give you this car at this price. Do you want to upgrade? I'm like, how much is the upgrade? She was like, oh, it's like a hundred dollars more. I'm like, I'm good. Don't worry about it. A couple minutes later, she's like, you know what? I'm just going to give you the upgrade. I said oh my god it worked it really worked (laughs) and that like we put that clip out and people were just like oh my gosh like you know that the Filipino card works you know the Mexican card works when someone figures out oh you're the same I got you it's like it's stuff that like that that and I think another huge success that like we have and that we felt really that we were making an impact was the food fest the Mexican food fest like the first one that we did, we did it in uh, San Francisco. Yeah. And Midas was actually DJing. Yeah. Uh, Anthony was actually <laughs> DJing. Yeah. And because he is Mexicano. So, you know, um, he's the target audience. He's the target. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it was just such a fulfilling moment for us. And then, you know, we were like, okay, you know, first Mexicano fan, I'm saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
<laughs> but you know that was such a fulfilling moment for us and then I was like okay well we did it in Nico's hometown now I want to do it in my hometown and then we brought it to LA and that was just we oh were, my god we were projecting what I think 500 500 yeah people. we were projecting 500 people and we got 3,000 in one day and that was like okay this is bigger than the both of us and we need to figure <laughs> out something quickly and we brought on for the next round of Mexipino Food Fest. We did a two day event. We uh, were highlighting Mexican Independence Day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the next day, we highlighted Filipino and Asian uh, culture. And we brought on my brother and my sister in law and our team. And mm -hmm. that right there was just the most fulfilling like, okay, I can bring my family onto what I'm doing. They can see firsthand how things are working. And also to all the families that come to Mexipino Food Fest, like it's we realize that it's not the gener the generation now, it's the generation that's coming that are Mexipino. A lot of people were like showing us their kids, like, oh my gosh, look, they're Mexipino. And I remember when one time a lady just handed me her baby. She's like, look, this is my baby. I was like, oh, okay. Then she's like, yeah, she's Mexipino. I was like, okay, I'm holding a random person's baby. But this is like, <laughs> but it was so fulfilling. It like just the community that it brings together. There's a family that have that has gone to our past two um, food fest that make their own shirts. And it's their Mexipino, their Guatemalan and Salvadorian. Yeah, I told them as long as you guys ain't bootlegging it outside, <laughs> of, the, outside of the festival grounds, we're good to go. Yeah, and but <laughs> it, like they, I noticed them because they wear their shirts. Like the dad has in the back, like Filipino by association, even though he's full Mexican. And then the kids are, they have all the flags on their shirt, the shirts that they are. And they're, like I said, Guatemalan, Salvadorian, Mexican and Filipino. So it's like a plethora of cultures, but it, it that's, it's just always so fulfilling. I literally got chills talking about it because yeah. it makes me so happy to be able to do something like that. Yeah. One thing I want to rehighlight too that Jackie mentioned was uh, the fact that we've been able to hire her brother and sister-in-law um, for these events. And, you know, I, I think the one thing that we never should overlook is always giving back to the people who care for us and giving mm -hmm. back to our communities, right? So we give back to the people who care for us by... Um, you know, giving them an opportunity to possibly leave the jobs that they currently have. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if this food fit, what we're projecting to do is about like seven food fests next year. And so, you know, it might be enough to, you know, help them out in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the opportunity comes where we're able to hire more of our family members or more people who are just interested in what the brand represents, mm -hmm. then I mean, that would probably be one of the most fulfilling things that I could ever do in life that we could probably ever do in life. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think like, you know, with, with Nico um, on a personal note with like Nico, like his sister loves to cook. Yeah. She is a phenomenal cook. And with the food fest, we told her like, Hey, you have a home at the food fest. If you want to start up your business at the food fest, do it. Like we want you to succeed in this way. And like, again, it just reiterates that we're, that's aside from, you know, the, like what we can do with the podcast and bringing all these cultures together, which is one of our, you know, main successes Our another main success is being able to do this for our families. Yeah. Where the impact hits a lot more deeper than just attending. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. And really inspiring so thank you so much for sharing that as well um speaking of kind of bringing on folks to your team how do you decide when is the right time to do that is it based on like demand like oh man like so many people are showing up like we need help or are there other factors that play into that I mean I had a bun like about a week ago Probably next week, I'm going to shave off my head. So when the stress levels get there, you know what I mean? That's when I'm like, we got to get more people on this. Yeah, no, I think definitely for like, uh, when when it came to my brother and my sister-in-law, it was, it was a no-brainer. My sister-in-law, like, you know, she has a degree in child development, and that's what she's always wanted to do in life. But I also know she has a passion for event planning. I know that 
you know, she's a very creative person when, she, when we have family parties, she's out there doing all the, like the balloon art. She's out there doing the centerpieces by hand. I'm like, I know what this, this is what she wants to do. So for us, it was, a, it was a no brainer. Like, okay, they have a passion for it. And also we were projected 500 people. We got 3000. We need help. Yeah. We need help. And, exactly. and I mean, that's really how it goes. And like Nico said, if someone like, you know, expresses interest in what Mexapino actually is a, as a collective, then, you know, we're always open to it. You know, yeah, we exactly. have Nick, uh, Nico's best friend who is a videographer and he cuts our podcast clips. You know, he helps us with that because, you know, we are so busy with our our other jobs as well. I mean, if you think about it, I technically have like four or five jobs, but um and I don't have the time to cut podcast clips, but we know his friend, his best friend that he's had for decades now is like is passionate about videography. So, hey, we want to give you this opportunity. Yeah, I think another issue um on like a uh on like an entrepreneur aspect is um when uh I, I was very much like a do-it-yourself type mm -hmm. of guy and i know er for the most part a lot of people are like if i can do it myself like why do i need anybody else to do it but you know just between any book i've read that's a lie i've never read any books but between <laughs> like any social media clips that i've seen right a lot of a lot of the uh like millionaires and ceos talk about like well if somebody else can do something better for you, that's your opportunity to hire someone. So like, you know, I, I'm a good video editor. Oh, I'm a decent one. And I know exactly what I need to do. I just don't have the time to do it because there's other things that I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to send out millions. And I know how to send out millions and zillions of emails to like vendors and I know how to market. But if there's somebody who is better at doing that, then I would rather they do it not for my sake, but for the brand's sake. Mm -hmm. So with the idea of um, scaling our business to greater heights, if we scale the business, there's no way we can't scale within the company. Mm -hmm. So in order to grow a business, you need to grow your business internally, mm -hmm. slowly and surely, you know, mm -hmm. you just, you don't want like snakes in the grass types mm -hmm. of situation, but yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. But I love that you you hone in on on what people are passionate about when when choosing and selecting um more team members. That, that's awesome. Um we'd love to now go over what the Mexican and Filipino overlap looks like. So back in 2016, um the Filipino American professor and writer Antonio Campo wrote a book called um, The Latinos of Asia, How Filipino Americans Break the Rules of Race. Um, and so in this book, he states that due to the legacy of Spanish colonialism in the Philippines, this meant that Filipinos share a lot more of the cultural characteristics that Latinos have. So things like religion, last names, language, food. And so with this uh, cultural overlap, wanted to see how um, both of you in your podcast are able to nurture this and help inform or inspire um, others on, on these cultural characteristics that are similar. I, I mean, I think the first thing that we do um, is identify what these things are. So, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes down to language or even religion, right, something as simple as having a uh, um, a last supper above like the kitchen diner or something like mm -hmm. that. Like, <laughs> that's very common in our uh, cultures. But I think once we identify these things, we just start talking about it and just see where it goes. Yeah. I mean, we did have Anthony on our podcast as well. So, I mean, like, um, Ocampo, Anthony oh. Ocampo, who wrote the book, okay. <laughs> 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 but, um, uh, you know, we, we talked to him about it and we've talked about it on our, on our podcast, on our, on our own that, you know, we see the similarities mm -hmm. and it's, I guess tackling those those similarities, we go at we go at it at a very 
kind of we we walk the the line about it because I truly don't know a lot about Filipino culture up until I met Nico and I'm like okay well what about this if I ask him a certain thing about like culture or you know we have us Mexicans have quinceaneras they have debuts you know like mm -hmm. it's like okay so you know because we're in a relationship and because we want kids it's like okay well are we going with the quinceanera or are they going with the debut because we're not doing both they cost hella money I know, like, they ain't about to have a luxurious <laughs> 15 year old birthday than an 18 year old birthday you picking one yeah no and it's just it's just finding that like you know the similarities the you know what works what doesn't and also breaking the the cycles of you know, maybe that's not something we want to do. We have, we share it in our cultures, but we don't really believe in that. So why don't we just not use it when we, when it's our turn, you know, when we have our kids, when we have the next generation, it's like, we, we want to break cycles, but, and we also want to continue certain cycles. And it's all just about talking about it, figuring it out. Yeah. I mean, for example, you might get hit with a chancla in a Mexican <sighs> household, or you might get hit with like a chinelas in a uh -huh. Filipino household. And I told Jackie, I'm like, we don't have to do that. No, we're not doing that. We're, we're not seeing flying slippers everywhere. <laughs> like I'm, I'm good off of that. Yeah. But I mean, it, I think with, uh, there's a lot of similarities and then being with each other's families, you know, um, oh my God. It's very similar, also very, very different. Yeah. I mean, we've learned, you know. You learned that both cultures are loud as hell. Are and, very, very loud. And everyone's just trying to get the conversation over the next person. It's like, can everyone please <laughs> just lower your tone just a little bit so I can get some peace? Every, everyone's talking <laughs> over each other. And it's like, okay, we've learned that that's obviously like a similar thing and there, there's much more deep-rooted similarities you know like you said with last names with with uh religion and everything. the aunties talking in the corner all talking smack uh, yeah you know what i mean that we happens. all have that one table at the family parties <laughs> where they're they're doing cheese man but um it's it's something that you know we navigate through and when as we share these similarities and experience personal experiences on our podcast a lot of people you know reach out saying hey I understand that and I think um something that I talked about recently which I hit home with a lot of uh female listeners uh for the podcast was my fear of of kids my fear of that trauma of having kids I talked about recently in, in one of our podcasts that uh, you know, Nico is older than me, so he wants kids sooner than I do. And I've talked about that, like, hey, you know, I've never said this out loud, but one, I I don't feel like I have a motherly instinct and that sucks. And I know I can get through that. But two, I've also been always so scared of having kids because of the threats I received growing up. Oh, if you get pregnant, you're out of the house. You know, a lot of us go through that and it's, it is traumatizing whether we think it is or it isn't, it is traumatizing. And a lot of people who related to that, you know, whether they were Filipino or Mexican had DM'd me and said like, you know, thank you for talking about this because this is something that I'm currently going through. This was a feeling that, you know, I was trying to express and didn't really know how to talk about it. And you bring it up, bringing it up was exactly how I felt yeah and then from the Filipino um from the Filipino experience at least my personal experience it's been like hey when I was like 18 years old like don't have a girlfriend <laughs> you know like up until like growing up it's just like don't have a girlfriend you're good just focus on yourself do your career da 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 okay I'm gonna do that now that I'm 30 years old it's like are you married yet when are you going to have some kids? I'm like, you told me my entire life not to have a girlfriend and not do this and not do that. Now, all of a sudden, you want me to have kids. You want me to have a family and everything. Mm -hmm. Well, what about all those years where I was trying to do all of that? Yeah. So, you know, there, there's a lot of irony in it. And I, I think another thing, too, that I want to highlight is that, like, you know, it, it's never like complaining about any of these things. It's just sharing these experiences in the best way that we can. And you know, I think 
Maybe sometimes we're just tom- uh, trauma dumping. Rocking but... over trauma. That's yeah. what we do. You that's know, fine. That's a lot. A lot of us do. That's fine. But that's another, <laughs> but you know, that's another thing that we don't talk about in our cultures as well. In both Mexican and Filipino cultures, we never talk about, we just never talk. We never <laughs> talk about opening up about the things that really make us vulnerable. And, you know, this issue of mental health. Like we were forced so much to um, withhold our feelings and not share these things. But we live in a day and age where it's literally okay to share everything. And it's even okay to share everything online. And it's even okay to share everything with another person that is on a completely outside of it. You know, it's like, a lot of our generation now is is going to therapy there you know we have we have these resources that you know our parents are like oh I remember like you know growing up my grandparents and my mom would tell me that they have stories where it's like what what do you have to be sad about like there is no thing as depression there is no thing to be sad about you know it's like but there is and it wasn't until you know 20 14 2015 where my mom herself went to therapy where then I went to therapy in 2017 2018 and that was like okay we're breaking these 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 traumas these stigmas you know and that's something that we talk about on the podcast you know a lot of people are like some people may think we overshare on the podcast and that is totally fine but I'd rather overshare so somebody can feel comfortable enough to talk to us to talk to somebody else Mm -hmm. then just keep it in yeah that that hits home pretty hard um I was I I have not told my family I'm in therapy and that I've been on I've been in therapy for years they would not for sure get it they said you should get closer to God and that's all good (laughs) <laughs> you're all set there We're proud of you, so. proud of you. That's, that's super dope <laughs> yeah. um but um now we're kind of wrapping up a little bit on time had a few kind of fun questions we'd love to ask first um who's your who would be like a dream guest for the pod Ooh, that's oh. a good one I don't that's a hell of a good question I would love I would love to have Becky G on our podcast. Yeah. I'd love to Becky. have Yeah, she she's an amazing person. I feel like here she'd be like just be more of just like conversation rather than like interview or anything like that. I would love to have her. I think I would love to have Manny Pacquiao on the podcast. Oh my god. I feel like <laughs> I feel like it would just be funny. <laughs> Like, I don't want to talk about no politics or anything. I just want to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I want to We, we I, both have clearly different uh, <laughs> ways of thinking. I want to ask him what he thought about that Drake video that keeps going viral every single Filipino American <laughs> history month. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That's amazing. I was going to say, you could also have Drake on as Manny Pacquiao during the interview at the same time brilliant i mean if crunch base wants to set it up we're, we're gonna pose. we will go there. Uh, amazing um and then i believe we have an audience question from anthony uh oh. you guys well hello, hello nico and jackie huge fans of the podcast by the way um jackie Bye. These are great. I watch them all the time. Um, Nico, you're an amazing DJ. Hopefully we can collaborate one day. And, and- <laughs> um, But my question for you both is because, you know, you do have so much involved in your your personal life and, and all your, you know, your, your side passions and everything like that. What would you say is the hardest part about balancing the podcast with all of that? Oh. With, DJing, with interviewing, with radio, like how do you... How do you navigate all that? You know what? Recently, and I'll I'll just open up about this here. So it's funny um, that Natalie brought up the uh, the radio stuff. I actually had to just let go of that a couple days ago, mm-hmm. um, simply because, you know, as as time goes on, you understand like what your real priorities are. 
or rather your priorities evolve that much more. And I've come to realize like, hey, I find myself slacking in one area and I really can't do that, especially when it's attached to somebody else's name. So I'm going to have to let go of that so I can open up my time and be more available, um, you know, for everything else that I got to do. Additionally, too, Jackie and I are in a relationship, which most people would not get into a business with their partner. There's very few, like yeah. Beyonce and Jay-Z, for example. <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, like letting go of other things that are no longer as important in my life is important for me because I need to make room for the things that are much more important to me, i.e. our relationship, i.e. the podcast mm -hmm. and everything else that we got going on. Yeah, I think the for me, uh, Nigo knows this, I uh, procrastinate a lot. I, you know, I I struggle to find balance most of the time. I'm getting better at it, um, but it does come with letting certain things go. It does, you know, I've, I do, like I mentioned earlier, I have like four or five jobs as an entertainment host. You're constantly wanting to go every which way and being pulled so many different directions. And I've had to sit down with myself, especially these past couple months and realize, okay, next year, what is it that I want? What is it that I have time for? Um, and you know, what is it, what is that I can share, you know, too, um, mm -hmm. a lot, a lot of our personal life is out there out in the open. So I have dialed back a lot on sharing on my personal life, especially on, on radio, because a lot of people will, will go in and tell you their opinions about your personal life. And, it's it's made me realize okay I need to step back from that I need to let you know certain jobs go and because what I really am passionate about is what we have built and what we are continuing to grow and Mexipino I know is more more than just Mexican and Filipino it's so many different cultures mm -hmm. it's families it's you know so so much more it's different cultures that we know can have a safe space and we have so many plans for it i mean hopefully in the future you know we can have the mexpino mexpino scholarship that's a goal for us yeah you know something that we really want to do um it's something i brought up to jackie um and you know this skull i guess now that we're talking about it mm -hmm. like this scholarship idea um is basically we want to um give give money to someone of either Mexican or Filipino descent or Mexipino descent who is looking to be in the creative field. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the first time we spoke about that publicly. Yeah. So and, uh, it, it's something that we're working on. Hopefully we can get that going um, next year. So, yeah, that's just, it's, it's all about letting things go, being okay with letting them go and knowing that your priorities are, are shifting because you're growing as a person yourself yeah and yeah that's amazing I love all of that thank you so much for sharing that um we are just about at time so I wanted to thank you again for for joining us today and sharing your experiences but before we let you go um is there anything else you know you mentioned the scholarship are there any other ways that you'd like to share with us that we can keep supporting you guys and the Mexipino brand overall um I don't know I just uh on social media at Mexipino podcast at Mexipino food fest um you know we're always open to to collaborating so we thank you guys for this opportunity we really we really do I mean um it's been quite an adventure I mean this this year uh, this was the first time I've been doing a lot of things during Hispanic Heritage Month. So, and it's, it's made me very proud. Um, yeah. so, I mean, the support is if you guys want to listen to the podcast, if you guys want to listen to what we want to say, <laughs> yeah. anywhere you find your podcast, that's where we are. We also have video, uh, video versions on YouTube. So you can see my reactions to all the things that Nico says. <laughs> yeah. And, and also too, um, thank you so much for inviting us to mm -hmm. this because I think support, support isn't always like, 
giving, 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 giving. But, mm -hmm. you know, in this particular case, it is still giving too, because you gave us an opportunity to speak not only to you, but to everybody over here at Crunch Base. And, you know, just this is a really great opportunity. And I know Jackie and I really appreciate it. And this in so many ways is a level of support that we cannot thank you guys at Crunch Base enough for. Mm -hmm. My gosh, well, I'm just about to cry. Um, <laughs> thank you guys. Thank everybody for coming. Um, we'll share out this recording with you guys, Nico and Jackie, and then also um, with all of us here at Crunchbase, we'll share um, happy Hispanic Heritage Month and Filipino American Heritage Month and enjoy your Thursday, everybody. Thank you again. Thank Bye. you guys. Bye-bye.